Um, and I did want to just, just before I get started, I want to uh, uh, note my uh, my co-author here, Vaughn Walton. Uh, you know, he's really been a, um, a great collaborator in the work I've done in uh, in wine grapes here. Uh, he's he's really been uh, spearheaded a lot of the work on emerging pests, uh, spotted wing Drosophila, brown marmorated stink bug, uh, but also all this vector work that, that we've done the last few years. He's he's really been on the forefront, and, and it's been great to to work with him. So I definitely wanted to share all the uh, you know, credit and any blame that's forthcoming with, with Vaughn. So, okay. Um, so yeah, just gonna give a quick brief uh, review of the red block situation, then get into the vector uh, work that's been done, you know, what we, what we, what we know, what we, what we don't know, and what we need to know perhaps going forward, and then hopefully talk a little bit about our invasive pest situation and maybe some other pests that aren't here yet, but that uh, I want you all to be, to be aware of. Um, so I don't know if you remember, if you were here last year, I got to introduce uh, Kent Dane and, and, and gave, gave a short introduction to viruses. And I, I told everybody, you know, I'm not a virologist. Um, you know, I, in fact, I, I said I did not even know enough to be dangerous. Um, uh, well, I've learned a few things in the last year. So um, the situation has changed. Um, and actually, the, 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 the two things I'd really point to are we had a meeting here in August. I don't know how, how many folks were here for that. But you know, we had Dr. Fuchs, uh, had uh, Dr. Sudarshana Sudi was here. Uh, Bob Martin was here, Von Walton was here, and just and, you know, had a great meeting about red blocks. Then we, then we went out. Uh, to the field and saw, you know, a red blotch in all its glory, uh, you know, just right in front of us. So it was just a great learning experience. It's fantastic. Um, and then I don't know how many of you all saw the the red blotch webinar that was like two two and a half weeks ago. Okay, okay. So you guys probably know as much as I do, probably. But um, a great great amount of information there. Just uh, just really fantastic. So I would definitely, um, if you want to want to know more. Uh, you know, you could just sort of, you know, we'll just click on this, and uh, oh, yeah, you, you're stuck with me. Sorry. So um, I just wanted to, um, you know, go, go over a little bit of the history. You know, we've had these nutritional disorders, uh, red leaf symptoms. I, I remember when Marcus started here back in, uh, in in 2008, and his first harvest. He was always getting calls. I got, I got red leaves. I got red leaves, and he was out running around. And of course, he's a soil scientist, so he's thinking, okay, it's, it's we've got nutritional problems. Uh, we've got uh, you know irrigation issues. We got we got Sara syndrome. Uh, but it became pretty clear that it was more than that. That there was uh, some real disease issues going on, and we got involved in uh, the leaf roll question. And um, there was a specialty crops research grant that was going on at that time, or just being started. Uh, I know Bob Martin was part of that, uh, Vaughn Walton, a uh, you know, large multi-state project, and some of that trickled down to us. So we, we did work on, le on leaf roll and, and mealybugs here for a number of years. But we kept running into this problem where we would, we would have symptomatic vines. We'd go out, and we'd test them, and they'd be negative. And that just kept happening. And that was a pretty widespread phenomenon that we just, we just, you know, we, we had these, uh, these look to be leaf roll, but it, it, it wasn't. So it became clear there was something else going on. And everyone, of course, started to, to scramble. I think the, the, the number one hypothesis was that it was some new strain of, uh, of leaf roll, probably. Um, but uh, it turned out that it was a new, a new virus uh, entirely. And so Sooty uh, down at the USDA uh, in Davis, uh, found this uh, virus and called it a uh, red blotch associated virus. Uh, independently, pretty much at the same time, uh, Mark Fuchs over in Cornell identified the virus. He called it uh, Cabernet Franc associated virus. Um, and then some folks in Washington uh, the, in 2013 also found it. And we were able to start detecting it. And it became clear it was, it was very widespread. So really 2013 is when we really sort of knew this was a, a sort of totally new, widespread problem. And um, you know, this really was not that long ago. So it's amazing how much has, has already been done since then. Um, so the effects of red blotch, um, consistently lower soluble solids, bricks, that's sort of number one. Uh, reduced photosynthesis, and chlorophyll. You know, I guess that makes sense. You've got red leaves, you got, you're, you're got, probably got less chlorophyll in there. Um, of course, reduced photosynthesis, you're, you're going to get less sugars. Um, 
The yield effects uh, have been inconsistent. Uh, you see some delayed ripening. Uh, Rhonda Smith uh, in that webinar mentioned she'd seen some trends to higher pH and titratable acids, but you know there's there, there's some uh, some variability there. Um, you know the real key is this sort of the hallmark of it seems to be these lower totable soluble solids, lower sugars. Uh, but to me, the biggest effect is one that Sudi just sort of mentioned. Of the initial 11 blocks that he's identified uh, with red blotch in that 20, 2011 to 13 period, eight of them have been pulled out. So um, you know that's for reasons uh, not just effects uh, to the plants, but also worry about spread. But still, when you know that, that's pretty about that, that's the biggest effect you can have if you're just pulling blocks out because you've got a disease incidence. So this is a, you know clearly a a a, a real you know, real problem. Uh, what, what else do we know? Well, it's graft transmissible. Uh, it's not transmitted through the seed. So that, that's one thing that, uh, uh, that's at least one little bit of good news. So it's not going to be transmitted to a, you know, in the plant to a seed that's dropped somewhere else. Um, there seem to be two genetic clades. They're called different strains, uh, but there, there's no biological differences between these, these two clades, but there is, there is some, some difference, a genetically measurable difference. I think Keith Perry said 8% heterogeneity. Or, um, and uh, Keith Perry also noted that vines that have tested positive red blotch have subsequently tested negative. And we've certainly seen that with, uh, with, with the testing we, we've done the, the last couple of years. And he, he also said there's just something weird about red blotch, something unusual. And he mentioned they hadn't seen any virus particles or proteins uh, that have been found. I actually did see something on the web so somewhere else that showed a picture of some virus particles, so I'm not sure who's, who's, who's right there. Uh, but, but another thing he mentioned that I thought was, uh, was interesting, he said they're working on, on in-field diagnostics. So you could actually perhaps be able to diagnose this you know, in the field. And I don't know how close they are to that or you know, how, how much it'll cost, but that would sort of be a pretty neat tool uh, to have if it, if it became available. Um, what else do we know? Just in terms of visual symptoms, you know, it resembles leaf roll, but there are some key differences. So there's these reddish veins, pink veins that uh, develop with, uh, with red blotch. Um, of course, the leaves don't roll like they do with, uh, with leaf roll. Uh, but uh, different cultivars respond very differently. We already saw some uh, uh, pictures of that uh, um, you know, from, from Duarte. They, uh, and, and in particular, these white cultivars uh, some of them can have few, you know, if any, symptoms. So uh, you know, just going back to, uh, you know, the if you've heard Mark Fuchs talk about uh, red blotch, you've heard this line, you know, test, don't guess. So, uh, you know, if you think you have it, you, you, you need to test it. And another pretty important point is that vitis species are the only confirmed host so far. So um, in terms of looking at a you know, refuge uh, or a reservoir host uh, you know, outside the vineyard, really you're only looking at wild or feral vines at this point. Um, of course, we've got a lot of those around, so th th there is that. And just to, to sort of wrap up um, this, it was just interesting to, interesting to, to hear that uh, you know, there was this specimen of early burgundy that was collected in 1940 in Sonoma County that they went back and you know found, did the genetic testing. Uh, De Deborah Galino uh, you know, showed showed the results, and this they actually tested 56 different uh, old specimens, and this one specimen uh, tested positive for red blotch. So that's 1940, Sonoma County. It's been here at least 75 years, uh, you know, bouncing around. We really don't know how it just suddenly appeared, blew up the way it did, uh, you know, in the last. Uh, Five ten years, uh, I think Sudi's Su explanation was well. We we we, th we thought it was leaf roll, so that, that's why we didn't really weren't on top of it. But it just seems the way it's the way it spread. You know, so, you know something happened. Um, so let me get into the vector research and results uh, to date. And there's a couple of ways to look for vector transmission. Now, first, you just look at the distribution and spread of the disease. You know, how is, where is it? How is it spreading? And what can you discern from that? You can also look at, uh, at genetic analysis and see where the virus fits in with other viruses and perhaps piece together information. 
But really, the, um, you know, the acid test is to do vector transmission experiments. You know, start in the lab, see if, you, if, the, if your vector you've identified can actually transmit uh, the virus. And you, know, you, you, sort of, you, you try to identify species that are found where spread is occurring, but which are absent where spread is not happening. So um, in terms of distribution and spread, well, it's not spreading in the eastern US. Um, doesn't appear to be spreading in Canada. There's no spread reported uh, for, from Europe. Uh, the fellow from, from Switzerland on the webinar who, who talked about the situation, you know, they'd found this vine, just sort of an aside, uh, in their collection that was red blotch positive. Um, it had been sent over, a, a, viro a virologist had gotten it because he wanted a specimen of leaf roll. And they had actually sent this vine over as a, as a specimen of leaf roll. It really was, uh, was, a, was red blotch. But they found no evidence of spread uh, in Europe. And um, Bob, uh, you know, Bob's done some testing, went back and looked at some of his um, uh, samples that he collected uh, you know, back in, uh, I think, 2008, uh, at, at least back that far. And he's uh, found that there are you know, a number of vineyards in the Willamette Valley that have had had pretty minimal or no spread uh, of, of red blotch. But there certainly are vineyards where we have seen spread occur in California and Oregon, and particularly um, here in Southern Oregon. Um, you know, there, there are definitely some just examples where, where spread is definitely happening. So <clears throat> uh, what are the main vectors of uh, plant viruses? And just to sort of recap, uh, there are a lot of plant viruses out there, more than 700. Um, about 70% of them have a vector. So that's 500 of these viruses you know, have sort of known vectors. Um, the most common are the sucking insects. So you know, it's your aphids, whiteflies, leaf hoppers, throw tree hoppers in there, plant hoppers, mealybugs. And um, you know, these are these sucking insects that pierce and suck the sap out of plants. And uh, so they're obviously you know, ideal uh, you know, ways to, to move a, a disease around. There are some other miscellaneous vectors. I did just want to point out thrips, beetles, bud and gall mites are perhaps notable because of this Pinot Gris virus it appears it may be transmitted by an aerophyte mite, possibly. Uh, also nematodes, you know, fan leaves, a, a good example of a nematode transmitted a virus in, uh, in, in wine grapes. Um, so we, we, we generally try to home in on those sucking insects. That, that's what we look at. And this is, I sort of, took this from Brian Botter's uh, presentation, um, and he did some genetic analysis of the coat protein. Um, and the, this data is all apparently documented, and he, he, he wanted to see where red blotch fit in. So he uh, it definitely fits in, these, in with these Gemini viruses, totally separate from leaf roll, which is a, which is a whole different, different group of viruses. And he had this you know, group of eight viruses that was pretty close, and then there's this one virus not too far in this group of 14. So when you look at the vectors that are known for these groups, these all are leaf hopper transmitted. Um, this one, the uh, tomato pseudo curly top virus, is uh, transmitted by a tree hopper. And finally, this group uh, were transmitted by white flies. So, this is sort of he's thinking. Well, uh, this is where I'm going to start looking uh, for for you know for a, a possible vector for red blotch. And uh, in grapes, we know we've got a lot of leaf hoppers. So this is a work that was published in 2014, um, documenting all the leaf hoppers in vineyards in Canada. So it was actually very timely that this this came out. So you know, uh, just uh, lots, dozens. Uh, of leaf hoppers that uh, that are that are found in vineyards, um, and there are a couple that are very well known pests, particularly these erythra neuro species. So, uh, grape leaf hopper um, is uh, the main grape pest back east, um, up into Canada. Uh, the variegated leaf hopper, sort of southern California, but it's now moved up to as far as Napa. Um, the western grape leaf hopper is our sort of leaf hopper pest that we have here and sort of well known in California. And then this Virginia creeper leaf hopper that's also mainly an eastern species, northern species. It was up in uh, Washington. And just a few years ago, it appeared in, um, uh, in northern 
uh, California. Uh, um, Glenn referred to it, and it caused serious problems uh, in some vineyards there, particularly the uh, the organic vineyards that didn't have the, the you know the leaf hopper controls that are available. And so you know here this 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 new leaf hopper in vineyards to California shows up and you get all this red blast transmission. So there was some thought, are these two, are these two things linked possibly? Uh, could, could there be a connection? Well, let me get into some of the vector transmission work that was done. So a group in Washington State University uh, using Virginia creeper leaf hopper in the greenhouse, 50 insects per plant, six cultivars. They put the insects on diseased, infected plants for 48 hours removed them, put them on clean plants for 48 hours. After four weeks, PCR test, 100% transmission. So this was published in 2013. Um, so I just want to emphasize 100% transmission. So I mean, I know those guys in the lab, they're going, yeah, whoa, slam dunk. We have nailed this, you know, whoa. Uh, now, myself being on the sidelines, you know, with the uh, hindsight and, uh, you know, I, I can say, you know, you probably should have said, um, that looks too good to be true. Uh, that's just 100% transmission like that. That's really uh, pretty amazing. So um, there were other people working on this same, uh, this, you know, this, uh, the same, doing the same kind of work. And Ken Dane, who was here last year, and I think he even alluded to this, uh, he also looked at Western Grape Leafhopper, Virginia Creeper and the variegated leaf hopper along with the blue green sharpshooter. 72 hours um, he used. After four months, his PCR tests were showing 0% uh, transmission. And, um, I'm not sure. It was, it was a cohort. I'm, I'm not sure the exact, exact number. Um, uh, and in addition to leaf hoppers, he also tested mealybugs, grape whiteflies, all negative results. And that was work he did in, in 2013 and 14. So um, he thought, well, maybe, maybe I didn't have enough. Maybe it wasn't enough leaf hoppers. Maybe leaf hoppers are a lousy, you know, <laughs> vector. So I'm going to ramp it up. So he did some new tests uh, starting in 2014, and he used leaf hoppers, hundreds to a thousand. He, he put as many on as the plants could withstand, and he upped the acquisition time to a week, and um, he called it his all-in approach, and um, zero percent transmission. Um, and then I want to refer to uh, some work that uh, Bob Martin did uh, up in Corvallis using Western Grape Leaf Hopper, about 300 individuals, again, seven day acquisition and inoculation times. Uh, Bob refers to this as his brute force method. Um, it's been two seasons, I, I gather, and 0% uh, transmission. Uh, and Bob also tested the blue green sharpshooter, uh, again, negative, negative results. So, um, the final researcher I'm going to talk about, uh, UC Davis, uh, they had their own program going, uh, and you know, you know, UC Davis, UC Berkeley has a nice little friendly competition happening there. Uh, but he started out, and he, he came out of Washington State with his degree, had looked at leaf roll, did a lot of work with the leaf roll uh, virus. But he started out with leaf hoppers, using Virginia creeper leaf hopper, western grape, variegated, 10 reps, but he started out with individual insects and 48-hour inoculation times, and after a year and a half, 0% uh, transmission. So he thought, yeah, I'd better up that. So he went to 25, upped his number of reps to 15, 72 hours, and still, um, you know, it's been four months now, and 0% transmission. So it's not looking good for leaf hoppers. Uh, you know, they just don't seem to be, except for that initial, uh, you know, uh, finding from Washington State, uh, it has not been, uh, they've not been able to repeat that. And of course, that's the hallmark of science is being able to get, uh, get repeatable results and just haven't seen it. Um, so Brian Botter did a number of other tests, but I'm going to home in on, uh, he, he identified five species in particular that he wanted to, uh, to look at because he was finding them in vineyards where he was seeing the virus move and he wasn't seeing them elsewhere this three-cornered alfalfa hopper, and then a couple of leaf hoppers, a psyllid, and another, another plant hopper. And um, again, he used individual insects, 48-hour exposure time. Uh, and the reason why I used individual insects, uh, was a, there are a couple of reasons. One, uh, he didn't have a lot of insects to work with. 
for one thing. So uh, that, that, that was, a, that was a, a biggie. But the other was, if he was finding very few of these insects, but you were seeing a lot of spread, it stood to reason that the insect must be a very good vector. Um, and uh, sure enough, after it's been five months and they're continuing uh, the uh, testing uh, as we go forward, it may turn out some of these other uh, potentials come up with positive results. But after five months, uh, three of the 20 reps have shown positive result. So 15% um, infection rate uh, after five months. So um, I think the general consensus is, you know, this is really solid work. He really did a really good job. He's got a lot of experience doing this, and uh, he, he, people feel pretty confident in this finding up, up to this point. Um, so uh, what about the three-cornered alfalfa hopper? Uh, Persistilis or Ceresa festinus, uh, you know, or entomologists get a little particular about the naming of things. I'm thinking just from what 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 I what I know of the situation that probably Ceresa is what's going to end up uh, end up being the official name. But if you look in the literature, most of the li literature for this insect as a pest is under under Persistilis. So it mainly lives on legumes, but it does have a very wide host range: grasses, shrubs, even trees. Um, it's actually known as a pest on soybean. Uh, it's also known to girdle uh, grape leaves. And it's occasionally listed as a minor pest. And if you go to the Oregon Viticulture uh, book we published in 2003, I was, I was one of the authors on the uh, insect and mite management chapter, uh, we included this as a, as, a, as a minor pest. And I think I can blame Bill Windover for that. And, and I guess maybe Phil Van Buskirk, I think, too, but uh, because it always showed up at Bill's place, or it seemed to be there. Uh, at, 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 there were some years where there was, there, was, there, was quite, there was quite a bit. And this was something I, 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 was, I was talking to Jason, I was, I was thinking about. It does have this very signature damage where it will feed on the stem of the leaf, and it, it feeds, and then it goes around the leaf, and essentially girdling the leaf. And the leaf just turns, turns bright red and just really stands out. So if you've ever seen that in your vineyard, uh, that might be a clue that you've got this insect around somewhere. Um, not as native to North America, but it has a primarily southern distribution, but it's known all the way up to Canada. Um, as I mentioned, it's a pest of soybeans uh, back in the southeast. So um, you know, it is, uh, it is curious uh, as to uh, what exactly is going on. This is a picture of it. Um, uh, the membracids or tree hoppers are known for their sort of uh, very crazy pronotums that they get sometimes. And uh, you can see this is actually sort of fairly normal looking. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty distinctive. And then I remembered back in 2009, we had seen this incredible infestation in a pear orchard. And um, they were just, they had just, were infesting this pear orchard. I don't know if you could quite see it. But there's an ovipositor there. There were just these little overposition scars. They were just laying eggs in these shoots. And I just thought, wow. I mean, it was just, I've never seen anything like it before or since. It was just, uh, and then there was no, no, there was no lasting damage. You know, the shoots did fine. Uh, it was, it, it just did, didn't, it, it wasn't really a pest. But it was there in, in massive numbers. It looked bad. So, um, uh, I sent that picture out uh, to Brian and uh, Frank Zalem. Said, "Oh, I think we have it here." And he goes, and, and Brian comes back and goes, "Well, you know what? Actually, I don't think that is the three-cornered alfalfa hopper. I think that's like a related species, the uh, Ceresa pacifica." Um, and he said that a, a couple of pictures he have he he has of it. So this Ceresa festina or Spicillus festinus, um, you can see it has. Uh, it has the main difference is uh, the male has got some color on it, but the Pacifica species has this real huge forehead, for want of a better word. Um, whereas this is this is sort of about you know half that height, so this just is much more pronounced. There, it's like a real you know, sort of an egghead uh, type of tree hopper. Um, so that was uh, that was. Uh, Interesting. So we've uh, we, we do we certainly seen the damage in vineyards. We do have this uh, this related species. We know that. I'm pretty sure we have the uh, Spicistilis here as well. Uh, but we're doing some you know going through the collections and, and verifying that. 
Um, so in Oregon, we have sampled four leafhoppers and other hemipterans in vineyards. We started in 2014. We uh, continued that this year, used uh, sweep netting, sticky cards. We preserved the specimens for further study, uh, possibly looking at the virus load. If we did find a species that you know, we thought was a suspect, we could go back and test it to see if it did have the virus. But really, that's not uh, definitive because any species that's feeding on an infected um, you know, vine is probably going to get some of the virus in it. So we find leafhoppers that feed on infected vines, they have, the, uh, you know, they have red blotch in them, even if they're not a vector. And we did sample vines to just establish the virus infection status. And this was funded by the Oregon Wine Board. And this is some data I showed you from last year. Uh, these were the number of leafhoppers we found in the sticky cards, and that was sort of the, what I was in charge of, from Southern Oregon and the Willamette Valley. And just to note, you know, most of the leafhoppers we found were almost 90% were Western grape leafhopper, and all of those were from Southern Oregon, none from the uh, Willamette Valley. Um, if we look at the, the leafhoppers other than Western grape leafhopper, numbers are much lower. Some of them, you know, almost a third of them, just we only got one. Uh, of, of, of a different species. Uh, we did get this privet leafhopper, Fibriella flori. And if you remember, that was actually one of the species that Brian Botter was testing in his, uh, in his five species that, that he selected to test. And that was our sort of second most common, uh, just under 4% of what we found. And it was found in all four of the, uh, the vineyards that we, that we looked at last year. So, um, so interesting. Uh, now this is just comparing 2014 and 2015 in one of the vineyards, and you'll just notice it's a little hard to tell, but this is Western grape leafhopper. Um, this is proportional uh, uh, numbers, so you can see we did catch some other leafhoppers later in the season uh, here in 2014. That, that's when we were picking up these other leafhoppers. If we look at 2015, um, we started earlier, put the sticky cards out June 1st. Um, you know, maybe it still wasn't early enough. But you can see we did pick up some other types of leafhoppers other than Western grape early, but then after that, it was almost all Western grape leafhopper. Um, so, uh, so what did we do differently? Well, we did do one thing differently. We switched our trap type uh, from a yellow sticky card hung up on the wire to a red um, delta trap down here in sort of in the fruiting zone. Um, so there's a couple of differences. Obviously, you've got the different trap type and the, the way it's the architecture, but also just the different location. We, we hang the yellow sticky card up in the canopy, whereas this is, this is down low, much closer to the, to the ground cover. Now, we had some experience using the red delta trap for trapping mealybugs for many years, so we knew we caught leafhoppers. But I was a little concerned switching the trap type. I thought, mm, what, what, what is that really, what, what, how's that going to affect our results? So I did a little study in another vineyard where I compared the yellow sticky card to the delta trap. This is number of western grape leafhoppers. And you see an R squared of 0.6, not, not bad, not, not great. Uh, you see the data gets a little fuzzy as the, as the numbers get higher. Uh, but essentially for every you know, one western grape leafhopper we get in the delta trap, we get a little under two in the sticky trap. So not, not bad. And I thought, well, that, that, that's okay. But uh, these are the different leafhopper species we trapped in the two uh, in the two types of traps, and you know, said we, we so we trapped 17 different leafhoppers. Only one species was caught in both kinds of traps. So um, you know, a lot of them are ones. Obviously, if you only catch one, you're only going to catch it in one of the types of traps. Uh, but um, here is you know here we have 14 and all in the yellow sticky none in the none in the uh, in the red delta trap. So you know I don't know if it's the different trap, but I think certainly the different location going from the up in the top of the canopy to down low. Probably we need to have put traps in both of those locations to, to cover the full the full canopy. Because it does seem like we're trapping different uh, different groups of species possibly um, in those locations. So this is. Um, data from the vineyard we went to, we're calling it vineyard number two, but uh, the vineyard we went to after our August uh, um, uh, meeting and saw red blotch. And you can see, here's 2014, uh, the light areas are where there was red blotch. This is a little uh, a pr program that Danny Dalton up in Von Walton's lab uh, does to show distribution. Um, so not a lot. Uh, and then this was 2015. So 
lot more red blotch. We went from 5.7% in 2014 to almost 35%, over a third of the vines we tested in 2015. So a six-fold increase. So really pretty extreme. Yeah, Jason. Is this based on symptoms or based on This is based on testing. This is based on testing. So um, yeah, the symptoms are probably even more dramatic, really. But uh, Looks like there was a lot of red blotch in 2014 and none in 2015 the same same lines from the visor removed were there. Well no, the light area is where there was red blotch. Right. Right, right. So 186 and 449. Oh, right here you mean? Yeah, part of it part of it had red blotch in both years. But part of it showed red blotch in 2014 and none in Right. Well I mean like this little uh, island here, that's just you know, there are only eleven vines that we so that's like a couple of vines. Right. Uh, yeah, so they're not positive, negative. And, and also, we, right, and we did have a case where a couple of these vines had tested positive the next year, did not test positive, tested negative. So, um, yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, you know, Daniel's done a lot of work with Mark Fuchs, a lot we've a lot of vines have been have been have been tested out here, um, but one thing you'll note: these little white numbers were the number of western grape leafhoppers we were we were we were catching. So we were catching a lot of western grape leafhoppers, particularly. Uh, it seemed like we were catching more in the areas where there was more spread. So back to that old hypothesis of well, maybe western grape leafhopper is spreading it, but it's just a really lousy, you know, vector. So that was that was sort of uh, our thinking at at, at one point. Um, now these are the the other leaf hoppers. This is this is Western grapes. We 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 went from 1,200 to over 1,600 uh, from 2014 to 2015. And that's using a trap that wasn't as good at catching uh, the Western grape leaf hopper. But these are the other species we we caught. And you'll note again, uh, only one of the species uh, did we catch in both in both years. Um, another point I wanted to make was looking at outside the vineyard. We found these uh, three uh, feral vines that looked like they were a little suspect, um, had them tested, and you know, one of them was uh, positive for, for red blotch. And these were very small vines, seedlings really. And so it's been pretty clear, you had know, this huge reservoir of red blotch or in, the, in the vineyard, you know, something was moving the red blotch you know, from the vineyard out into this, uh, this wild area. So um, this was the one, uh, little leaf opera that we did catch in both years, and it also was our highest that we caught in 2015, Delta Cephalus Grex. So it's something we are gonna be, be looking at more closely in the upcoming season, uh, because here uh, we did not catch any privet leaf opera. Uh, that's this one right here, which was our high in 2014, and no three-cornered alfalfa leaf, hop, leaf opera or tree hoppers of any kind in either year. Uh, and that goes for all the sweep net samples that Vaughn has, uh, has now gotten through everything and just no uh, tree hoppers or alfalfa, uh, uh, alfalfa hopper. But we may have been started too late, we may have missed it, we're going to start earlier this year and uh, see what we can find. So these are some shots that Vaughn just sent me yesterday, so this is hot off the press. Uh, he's going through all the uh, uh, you know, perhaps suspects and don't, uh, don't hold me to any of these identifications. Um, but uh, this is that one I mentioned, uh, Delta Cephalus grex. Uh, you know, are we going to worry more about the Western grape leaf hopper? Is that something we really need to worry about? I think pretty clearly the work has been done. You know, that's, that's, this doesn't seem to be a reasonable choice as a vector. So we're going to focus elsewhere. And this is our, our Ceresa pacifica. And this was a specimen that um, Chris Hedstrom found on a blackberry in a vacant lot last summer in Medford. So I know this is around, and Chris actually used to work in Vaughn's lab and now works with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. So, um, so we're going to you know, see what we find and, and go out and, and do, do some searching. So I do want to cover a couple of other pests uh, before I, I, I finish up. Gill's mealybug I mentioned last year. Um, this was found in 2014 in the Southern Oregon vineyard near Jacksonville. Um, it's the first time it was found in Oregon. You know, I know it's infected some vineyards in Lake County as well as up in the uh, in the foothill uh, region. Um, 
It probably, I think, can transmit leaf roll. We, we suspect that. Uh, but it, it, can, it can be a pest, so it's something to be on the watch for. So far, we've only found it in just a couple of vineyards, uh, but uh, just keep an eye out. So this is sort of what, I, what I'm asking for. Is folks, just be on the lookout for, for odd-looking mealybug, strange things of any sort, but these gills mealybug produce these little sort of fiberglass-like filaments, and uh, they are pretty distinctive from our regular um, grape mealybug. Pinkish red spots, too, are hiding that, too. Right, these little pinkish red spots. Uh, so yes. If you see it, you know, bring it in. If you have a doubt, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it. Um, now this was, uh, I don't too much time. This was uh, something I found this, uh, this summer. It was out in our orchard. It was actually in a sticky trap. And you know, it was interesting because here, Virginia creeper leafhopper was causing problems up in uh, Washington, became this huge problem in Northern California, just like leapfrogged us. And that just doesn't, that almost never happens. Um, so I saw this, this, this fellow out, of, out in a sticky trap. I thought, ah, I think we've got it. And it was in, it was in our orchard. Of course, you know, that's what, that's what happens too. It shows up in the research orchard. So I went out just to check the trap. And here, right under it, is a Virginia creeper plant. Like, OK, that's it. Uh, we, we got it. And uh, the, but I, no leafhoppers anywhere. So I looked at leafhoppers, but we had sprayed the block with a neonicotinoid for cobbling moth and uh, that would take out any leafhoppers. So I did find this one pair of leafhoppers, a male and female, because they, they were, when I found them, they were together. And I took this uh, pretty poor picture, sent it out to the ODA and, 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 and some other folks, and he looked at it, and uh, Josh Vlatch up at the ODA says, you know what, that's really not Virginia creeper leafhopper. That's this other leafhopper. Uh, that's not a pest of wine grapes, but it may be the first time you found it in Oregon. Um, in fact, it's not really a pest of any note at all. So, uh, okay, so, so, so not everything we find is, is, is a problem. So, so far, still no, no Virginia creeper, creeper leafhopper, uh, at least infecting wine grapes in Oregon, has, has been reported. Uh, getting into a couple of our old friends, just to remind you, uh, these are our sort of invasive pests, spotted wing drosophila, brown marmorated stink bug. You know, spotted wing came into California, 2008, rapidly showed up. It was here in the fall of 2009. Um, it was already causing damage in the Lama Valley in the, the summer of 2009. Uh, rapidly spread all across the US. It's in Europe wreaking havoc with their small fruits. Uh, just a huge, a huge problem. Mainly attacks cherries, but will also attack caneberries. Your red raspberries seem to be its favorite, but it, it can do well on our wild blackberry. Also can be a problem in blueberries. Uh, you know, we found it in strawberries, but uh, it doesn't seem to be a major issue there. Have not found it in grapes locally. So, uh, so that's more good news. Has occasionally been a problem in grapes. I think some recent reports out of Europe. Uh, Vaughn did some work in the lab showing it can, it can move Acetobacter around. So you know, it's, it's, it's something that we're, I don't think we should be too concerned about, but I don't want to uh, totally ignore it as a potential issue uh, down, down the road. It does seem like the populations are almost still go going up every year. Uh, brown marmorated stink bug. How many of you have heard of brown marmorated stink bug? How many of you have seen a brown marmorated stink bug in your house? Uh, you know, these guys came in. Uh, I think the first one we found was, uh, was 2012. And um, you know, they're becoming our most common stink bug around. We do have some you know, look-alikes you need to be aware of. Squash bug, I get that brought in to have some native stink bugs. You would say, OK, who could possibly uh, confuse a box elder or maple bug with a brown marmorated stink bug? Believe me, it happens. So, um, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's actually, you can almost tell by the egg mass. The egg mass is almost always 28 eggs, which is, which is, which is pretty unusual. Um, the uh, first instars stay by the egg mass, but then as they molt, they, they do change uh, form a little bit and start to disperse. They always have this banded antenna. So it's pretty easy to, um, to identify generally. Uh, again, is it going to be a problem in wine grapes? Um, you know, it's been back east for a while, causing havoc in tree fruit orchards. Uh, apples, peaches, uh, probably going to be a big problem in pears. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be a huge problem in the wine grapes back there. <coughs> At least uh, I haven't seen any definitive work. I know. Elizabeth Tomasino has done some work on taint here in Oregon, and it, it uh, so far uh, it looks like we may, you know, it may not be a huge pest. But again, I don't want to lose lose uh, sight of it. I found my first 
uh, brown marmite stink bug last summer out in an, in an orchard. Uh, it's the first time I've seen it in an orchard or, or vineyard. Um, but it is causing problems up in Milton Free Water. There was an orchard this last year, 50% damage to the apples. So it has potential to be a, uh, a serious tree fruit pest. Um, really, now it's mainly a nuisance factor. It didn't turn out very well. These are, these are brown marmorated stink bugs all around this tasting room. So you know, that may be the biggest problem you have to deal with, uh, is just ha having, you know, uh, it doesn't contribute to the ambiance. Uh, we are looking at biological control. You know, we have this classical approach where you bring in an imported uh, parasite to deal with an imported pest. Have this great agent, 50% uh, average parasitization back in China. Uh, it's being looked at in quarantine facilities, both in Corvallis and back, uh, back east. But you're always concerned that it could attack native stink bugs, predatory stink bugs, rare stink bugs. So they're very careful about releasing anything, because once you release it, you can't undo it. Um, and we're looking at native parasitoids because it was looking like this might be a tough one because it, 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 it did, didn't seem to have the nice narrow host range that, that, that we wanted. However, new, new news, this, uh, this uh, parasitoid was found in Maryland 2014 and then just last summer showed up in Vancouver, Washington. So um, just came, you know, showed up on its own. So I don't know, it uh, probably came over on an egg mass. Uh, and uh, the, you know, they actually did check to make sure they weren't escapees from the quarantine facilities. They could do the genetic analysis. Nope, totally different uh, strains. In fact, the strain that's back east is different than the one that is, uh, that is out here in the, uh, in the west. So we're gonna follow this. We hope it'll do you know, good things for us. Uh, it's obviously very well adapted to brown marmot stink bug back in China, and we're hoping it will uh, it will do the same thing here. Yeah, but no no guarantee. So a, a few other pests to be aware of, and these all come from sort of uh, Glen's country down in California. So I just think you know that's close enough and similar enough to our region that I did want folks to be to be aware of them. Uh, the vine mealy bug. That's another one I've mentioned here. Uh, similar to the grape, our grape mealy bug, but it's, uh, you know, it does look different, doesn't have the tails. Uh, they both are known to transmit leaf roll virus, and it's just much more of a pest. Uh, it's in Napa, it's definitely a, uh, a big problem there, and it's one that we don't want uh, here up in, uh, up in Oregon. Luckily, there is a pheromone trap for it. I've been trying to get ODA to use it, getting a little bit of resistance. Uh, well, hope, hopefully I'm wearing them down, but it would be good to have an early warning system in case this, uh, this uh, bug gets here, because we, we really don't want it. Um, light brown apple moth. Now this showed up in, uh, this is a leaf feeding insect, but if the leaf gets up to the fruit, it'll scar the fruit. We have a lot of leaf rollers like that that are around here. Um, this insect is uh, native to Australia. Showed up in 2007 in the Bay Area, Santa Cruz, and LA. Now it's moved up as far as Napa and Sonoma. It's a major apple pest in Australia and New Zealand. It can attack over 250 uh, crops, including grapes. It has not really become a serious crop pest in California. So um, even though they have a quarantine, every single crop is exempt. Commercial crop is exempt, as far as, far as I can tell. Um, uh, we did catch four moths in the Willamette Valley Nursery, the ODA did, in 2015. So again, um, something to, to, to just be, be aware of. Um, this is actually data from early on in the infestation. Uh, so this goes up to 09. It's up to 1,000 square miles had become infested. Uh, initially, they were going to try to treat using encapsulated pheromone for mating disruption, and because they, you know, they were going to be treating Santa Cruz and San Francisco, so they wanted like the, the most benign thing they could possibly have. Um, needless to say, it was not benign enough, so that did not happen. So uh, they, they, they really they did one little test spray in Santa Cruz, and that was, that was it. it was, they were done. So they're pretty much not really trying to control it. Uh, it's not here yet, but it seems like it's, um, you know, it is uh, colonizing California very well. Uh, now this one, European grapevine moth, Lubezia batrana, uh, is a major pest of grapes. So it does not just feed on the leaves, it goes right into the fruit and really feeds on the fruit. I've heard it described as, you know, cobbling moth for grapes. So, um, and having dealt many years with cobbling moth, it's, that was not a good thing to hear. Uh, you know, like cobbling moth, um, 
the larvae get into the fruit, and then when they overwinter, they have this little uh, hibernaculum, they pupate under the bark. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's fairly narrow host range. Uh, grape is the, is the primary host. There, there are a, a couple of other um, species, but it's not that wide host range that the light brown apple moth has. Um, that's a big plus. It also has multiple generations, which lead to the population buildup. Uh, there is a related species back east, the grape berry moth, just one generation, so it's much easier to control. You know, this is a major problem in Europe. So it's definitely a pest we would not want to have uh, in, in our vineyards. Uh, but to end on a good note, so this showed up in Napa County in 2009. So, you know, shows up in Napa, major pest, uh, you know, obviously a lot of concern. They really went after it. You know, we're talking full court press, you know, trapping, surveying, uh, controls, uh, really just a, uh, so, in 2010, they caught 100,000 moths. Next year, down to just over 100. So 99.9% .9 reduction. Um, you know, it was found in other counties. So it had obviously been there uh, for a while. Uh, but after 2012, only found in Napa. And in the last two years, you know, they caught one moth in 2014, none in 2015. So uh, really just an incredible example of what you can do if you really give it everything and do a really serious uh, eradication program. They're not saying it's eradicated yet. They need a couple more years of zeros before they can uh, you know, proclaim that. But that's really, really good news that uh, you, know, you, you can perhaps uh, control a pest that really, uh, has a really big foothold in an area. So just thanks to the funders and to my colleagues. A lot of folks have worked on this, and also the field staff that does all the, does all the dirty work. Um, and we did get funded for this next coming year uh, to continue this work. So we are going to be looking at other potential vectors. Um, and a special thank you to our, our collaborating growers. Now, if you would just stop pulling out all the red blotch infected uh, vines, that would really be helpful. No, kidding, <laughs> kidding, of course. Um, I understand that. And then just to, uh, I did want to mention a couple of upcoming meetings or, or an upcoming meeting. Uh, it's going to be hosted by live uh, at the end of the month. And we're bringing in uh, Dr. Houston Wilson from Berkeley. He's going to talk about uh, you know, biological control for vineyard leafhoppers. I know he's been up in Glenn's, Glenn's territory. A incredibly knowledgeable fellow, um, postdoc there, as well as Dr. Jepson from OSU, who's going to be talking about our pesticide stewardship partnership, looking at pesticides and their risk. You know, we do have a program going where we are testing the ODA and the DEQ, we're testing our surface waters. We are picking up pesticides in those waters, mainly herbicides, but we do find, uh, on the insecticide side, we mainly find neonicotinoids. So imidacloprid, acetamiprid, and we certainly know that uh, you know, we're still using those uh, for, for controlling various pests in, uh, in, in, in vineyards, as well as as well as many other crops, and as well as uh, you know, certainly homeowners are you, are using those materials. Um, and then yes, I would recommend everyone to go check out uh, uh, Betty's book in the back there. You know, she's a local treasure. She's, she's a good friend. Uh, uh, she would have been here herself, but she's flying to Eritrea right now. She's invited by by them. She she was all over the globe, but uh, you know, the last few years she's really settled and doing work on local agriculture. And that's been sort of her passion. And I know in the book, she interviews uh, Michael Moore and Laura Lotspeech, and, and uh, you know, she has a great heart and produce, produce some great art as well. So I would, uh, and it's a published by a local publisher, so it's all, all local. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.